Good morning and welcome to the service of worship and praise for Sunday, October the 4th. We begin with a few announcements. We are pleased to be reopening for in-person worship next Sunday, October the 11th, Thanksgiving. Session continues to consider COVID-19 transmission rates and will adjust our plans if needed. We will confirm our plans via the call multiplier and email late this week. Services will continue to be streamed to the internet for those who are not yet prepared to share in-person gatherings. For those of you attending next Sunday, please ensure that you wear a face mask and maintain two meters social distancing throughout your time in our church facility. The Out of the Cold team met on Thursday evening to prepare for the upcoming months. We will be serving packaged meals to the vulnerable of our community from the front of our church throughout the winter months. Volunteers are welcome to assist with preparing, packaging, and distributing the food. We are pleased to be able to serve the gospel of Christ in this way. If you'd like to help with this work, please give us a call at the church office and let us know. My friends, it is our practice that on Sundays when we gather in worship, the offering plate is passed. The offering is an invitation to share the gifts that God has blessed us with, an act of gratitude and generosity that reflects God's generosity. The offering plate is also a symbol, a reminder that all that we have is from God, even we ourselves. There have been times in Christian history when little was put into that plate. Think, for example, of traditional agricultural communities. For much of the year, there was nothing to give. Abundance only flowed at the time of the harvest. But each Sunday, the plate would be passed as a reminder that God provided, that we could trust in God. I share this because today is World Communion Sunday. For the first time in generations, we are unable to gather together to participate in the sacred celebration of our unity in Christ. And yet even that does not rob today of its meaning. As we acknowledge World Communion Sunday today, we remember that we stand in unity with Christians of all places and all times as we worship and celebrate the one who gives us life. We look forward to the day when we can share this meal together again. We place our hope in God. And so, let us worship together. Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, ye believe in God, ye believe in God, believe, believe also in me, in my Father's house a man for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, I will come again and receive you, receive you unto myself.
we lift our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, Creator, Christ and Spirit, when we hunger for fulfillment, you meet all our needs. You give us the bread of life. When we thirst for your presence, you draw us near in every place at any time. You fill our cup to overflowing. You alone are truth. You alone are love. For you are the one who was, who is, and who ever shall be. Holy One, you are our hunger filled, our thirst quenched. You are our deepest desire fulfilled. So to you, O God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, we give praise with all of your people, here and everywhere, now and always. God of mercy, we confess that we have often failed to speak and to act with kindness. We have not always cared for others as you care for us. We have not welcomed others as we have been welcomed to your table, nor have we forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We remember the good not done, kind words not spoken, and things we regret. If only we could make these things right. But our hope is not in ourselves. It is in you. And so we turn to your mercy that grace might flow to us, through us, and into the world, that all might know your love. Bless and guide us in these things we pray. Amen. My friends, believe the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is fading. The new life has started to emerge in us. Know that indeed you are forgiven, and so have the courage to forgive one another. As we turn to scripture, we begin by reading from Psalm 80. This passage is a community lament. Its origin may have been from the time of Israel's decline, somewhere around 730 BC. The verses we read today recall God's past mercy to the Israelites, and the passage completes with a request for redemption. Hear these words from Psalm 80, verses 7 to 15. Restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine, that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, you cleared the ground for it, it took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches into the sea, and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit. The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted. And also reading from Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 to 46. These are the words of Jesus. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you 
and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds, because they regarded him as a prophet. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We live in a time when people seek out power, control, and authority over one another. You don't have to look very far to see it. The political sphere is an obvious example of such observation. But this kind of behavior is even closer to us. Many families are blessed with well-meaning members who seek to gently direct the paths of their loved ones. Even my children, who get along spectacularly, have moments when one seeks control or dominance over the other, and it's not usually well received. But if you want to see the roots of a desire for power or authority, perhaps searching some of the darkest corners of your own heart might reveal some seeds that you would rather not have grow. This kind of seeking is not new. Occupations and tyrants and enslavement and prejudices and abuses have been with us for as long as humans have walked the planet. Even our own origin story, the biblical account of the fall of humanity, Adam and Eve, involved distrust of God, a taste for divinity among humans and a grab for unwarranted power. It is to this kind of environment that Jesus speaks. Listen to another parable, he says. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. This parable is an allegory. The characters in the vineyard represent certain relationships between God, the Jewish leaders that Jesus was speaking to, and the crowds that were gathered around them. Let's take a few moments to unpack the story a little bit, and then reflect upon what it might mean for us today. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, Jesus says, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. The landowner represents God. The vineyard, creation. Note that the owner doesn't just set up some land for a tenement, but equips it with grapevines, a fence, a wine press, and a watchtower. God has blessed creation with abundance and provided richly for his people. We know because we are living in that abundance. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. We are stewards of creation. We don't own this earth. We don't own anything. We are caretakers, tenants. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. Remember, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish rulers of his day. And there are probably crowds of common people gathered around as well. They would have been taught from the time they were children of the prophets and the teachers that were sent to the children of Israel to teach God's truth and to turn the people back to God's will. Many were met with violence. Some were killed. Others were merely ignored. The people loved to follow in their own ways, seek out their own power, control their own lives. Isaiah said it like this, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that is what God has done. The Son was sent, the fullness of God's goodness given to us in human form. We know well what happened. Jesus says it like this, But when the tenants saw the Son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, 
and killed him. Jesus asks his listeners a question. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And the rulers who are conversing with him reply, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. And in that reply, these rulers realize a truth about their own struggles and quests for power, control, and authority. Their response is not repentance. Their response is not humility. But rather, they look for a way to take care of their problem, to kill the son and get his inheritance, if he will. Jesus tells them that the kingdom of God will be taken away from the fruitless and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. What does all of this mean for us? Let me suggest three things. First, if you find yourself in your life in a position of authority or influence, I would encourage you to do everything that you can to carry out that role in humility and in trust that God will guide you. I remember a line in a song that said, his rich kids think that they're better because they're better off. It's important for us to remember that we are not our circumstances and circumstances can change. Throughout history, the powerful become corrupt in their hungry quest to preserve that power. But our trust as Christians is not in ourselves. We can receive authority and let go of it. We can face struggle and overcome it without becoming inwardly changed. The Apostle Paul wrote, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And so can we. Second, when the wicked prosper, do not lament. In a given situation, we may find ourselves asking the question, where is justice in this? The sideways comment from the Jewish rulers about judgment in this morning's reading reminds us that God is in charge. It is hard to understand the struggles that this world faces. Sometimes we observe these struggles from a distance, and sometimes we ourselves stand in the midst of them. But in all such moments, we can live in trust that somehow, in ways beyond our own understanding, that in all things God works for good for those who love him. Third, don't dismiss or underestimate the influence of a crowd. We are seeing grassroots movements bringing change to our world today. It is the power of like-minded people living out a common principle. In today's reading, the powerful people, the chief priests and the Pharisees, seethed with anger when they realized that Jesus' parable was about them. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to have him killed. But we are told they feared the crowds. As Christians in 2020, sometimes we can feel like we are part of an institution whose best days are in its past. But I don't believe that for a second. We are a part of a movement, a unified body of grace and hope, in a world tainted with quests for power and sorrowful nihilism. We have a voice that is to be heard. And so, let us speak. We follow the one who gave himself for us. We celebrate Christ's gift of mercy, forgiveness, and life on this World Communion Sunday. My friends, may you be blessed as you follow in his way. Amen.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, this day and forevermore. Amen.